What's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Joined, joining me today. See, I already messed up. There we go. Joining me today, my guest Noah Lagel. We're going to talk in a moment. Um, if if you if you enjoy nerding out about martial arts, I th I think you're going to dig this episode. And I say that only because you know I've been following what Noah does for several years now and know that he enjoys nerding out about martial arts. And I do too. So we're going to have some fun on that to the audience. If you happen to be new, two things I want you to do. I want you to check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's where we post all the stuff related to the episodes. We've got transcripts and links and photos and videos and all that good stuff. Anything that Noah and I talk about today is going to end up over there. You'll see some of that in your show notes, but if you want the full, ver full version, go, go check that out but also whistlekick.com because why are we here? We're more than a podcast company. We do so many different things. And if you want to get ahead of all of those things, if you want to check out Whistlekick Alliance for your martial arts school, if you want to come to one of our events like free training day, which is literally free. And there are four of them this year in 2024. And who knows what year you're listening to this, but uh, you can also use the code podcast one five if you choose to buy anything because yeah, we sell stuff because uh, things cost money like food and, podcasting platforms. But here we are, Noah. Thanks for being on. I'm glad we're getting to do this, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. I, I'm trying to think, you know, how, how long have I known who you are? <laughs> two, three years? Two, three years? TikTok? I think yeah, where, if where we're going by TikTok. Gaming. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what I think struck me about you initially was you have a academic way of approaching a lot of things in martial arts. And that's something that resonates for me. You know, it's not just, oh, this is what my instructor taught me to do. So that's what I'm going to do. And if you do it differently, you're wrong and stupid, but more, <laughs> huh? Okay. Well, let's see if you have a point there. Let's take a look at it from practicality and physiology and, and all of these other things. You always been like that? I would say so. Um, Probably not so much in the very beginning of my martial mm -hmm. arts journey because you are in that that shu phase of shu haori, the copying phase mm -hmm. of learning, and so you know you're just trying to swim <laughs> in a sink or swim situation because uh, you know or maybe you jump even not in. drown exactly. Uh, you know, you get thrown into the deep end sometimes yeah. when you start out in martial arts training and you feel like you're getting so much information. Uh, so quickly, you just don't really have time to think about it. You just have to try and do it. Right. Um, but after I got more comfortable with it, which I was able to do relatively quickly because of how much time I devoted to it, mm -hmm. um, you know, most people, I'm not expecting them to do what I did and spend 13, 14 hours in the dojo every single week, plus another hour or two every day at home kind of a thing. It's a lot of training. Uh, that. Uh, when I jumped we're, into we're gonna, it, we're going to talk about that in a second. Keep going. <laughs> we're going to talk uh, about that. Yeah. But when I jumped into it, I got basically obsessed with it. So I started, mm. you know, doing all that training. And after a while, it becomes comfortable enough that you can slow yourself down mentally and start actually thinking about what you're doing. Um, and I was lucky to have instructors who would be happy to incorporate uh history into their classes mm. and uh you know mention comparisons from different styles that they were aware of uh, granted that was still a relatively insular experience it was still from the perspective of people who you know focused on one style of karate and uh you know it was the style they liked the best so that kind of uh, lent a bias to to that but um it really still instilled in me an interest in uh, more than just doing the physical activity of karate. That was a mm. big thing for them, that if you're going to do a traditional martial art, you should learn about the traditions of it, about the history of it, about the philosophies of it, and so on. And that just sort of carried me from there. And when I went from that dojo to training on my own for a couple years, um, karate-wise, I had a judo dojo during that time that I attended still, but karate didn't fit my schedule. Uh, so then when I finally got back into karate uh, with an instructor, I happened to have done a bunch of research in the meantime, uh, you know, being on my own, solo training, all that research was essentially sparked by that interest I was initially given 
mm. when I started. And that informed what I was looking for in a martial arts instructor. And that's how I found uh, my late sensei, uh, Richard Polk. And he had a really practical uh, but open mindset with the way that he taught things and the way that he uh, you know, encouraged his students to learn because he wasn't one of those just like copy what I do and do exactly as I say kind of guys. He was very much uh, a, okay, how do you see it? Mm. Kind of kind of instructor. Um, you know, at least once you'd had a, a, enough time to develop a base, right? Sure. Um, and yeah, I think that that's just sort of been a mentality I've had throughout my entire martial arts career because of the influence of the instructors that I had. Uh, and even before that, I just had a, uh, you know, I valued science and the scientific method. I valued um, logic and reason and that kind of thing from you know my parents, the way that they raised me and all that. So uh, it all just kind of goes together. <laughs> How old were you when you started training? I was 18, actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, Bit of an atypical age, but that lines up, right? You know, I don't know. I don't know if you went to college, but for for most people, they get out. You know, they come out of high school around eighteen, and we we have there. There are a couple things that happen for most of us. I think you're far enough away from eighteen. I can say this without offending you. You know, for most of us, especially men at eighteen, we really think we we know it, right? <laughs> we we really think we've got a good handle on what life has for us, and for a lot of people that can lead in a very different direction. You know, what I'm hearing from you is you at the right time, likely ended up with the right person who planted not, you know, this, but constantly ask the question, what I don't know, you know, and I'm certainly putting words in your mouth, but I think it lines up with what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how fortuitous that is. And, and certainly you've, you've continued with that approach. But why? Why at 18? Because again, that's, that's not an age, at least in the States, that people generally start martial arts training. Yeah. What happened? Well, uh, at 18, the, the short answer is because I was making my own money and I was an adult, so I, I could sign my own waivers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what's, but, what's the most violent thing I can do now that I'm 18? What can I do that my parents would not want me to do? <laughs> oh, I'm going to go get punched in the face and you can't tell me no. Right. Is oh, it's a, uh, not quite. It's even it's even worse than that because what I wanted to learn was was swordsmanship specifically. I didn't I didn't want to learn unarmed martial arts. I wanted to learn Japanese swordsmanship. You didn't want to get punched. You wanted to get cut. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, but really, what it was was um, I had done wrestling uh, when I was younger for a mm. couple of months, but that experience was so bad mm. um, and abusive on the part of the coach. That, You're picking that word carefully. Uh, yes, that is. Wow. That is. Okay. I am. I am very specifically using that word yeah. because that is the accurate word for that situation. I'm so sorry. Um, he taught me nothing, and he almost got me severely injured with his approach to coaching me. Coaching is a term I'm using very lightly. Yeah. Um, so that being my initial martial arts experience, I don't think that. I had at that point any inclination to seek out more martial arts ex experiences, um, you know. And but at that time, I was a kid and I was interested in the Power Rangers and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and so on. Um, so I had an interest in those things, but after that experience with wrestling, I didn't seek any out. Um, I did, however, around the same time, start to develop an interest in Japanese culture through anime. I was an anime nerd, uh, and for my junior year term paper, I did a full term paper on the method of making a Japanese sword, the traditional process of making a Japanese sword. Um, that's that's cool. actually what got me into bladesmithing, which is a hobby of mine now. But That I didn't know. Okay, we'll talk about that. Too. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, but um, just that interest in weapons had always been there mm -hmm. for me, and then just starting to learn more about weapons and then getting into the anime and seeing all these really cool Japanese swordsmanship type uh, personas being given with things like Rurouni Kenshin and Inuyasha. Uh, 
uh, you know, that sort of thing. I just wanted to learn how to, you know, wield the Japanese sword. I thought that was super cool. The trouble was the nearest um, kendo school, which is what I was kind of looking for, was about an hour away. And where were you living at this time? I was living still uh, with my parents in a tiny town that barely registers on a map, but central Illinois, okay. um, uh, near Peoria. People will Got probably it. have Got the, it. that's the closest you're going to find. Um, but it was, it was too far away to drive there, uh, you know, reliably, depending mm. on when you get off work and that kind of thing to make it in time for class. And I discovered uh, that training in kendo is very expensive to start um, because the armor is like $400 by itself. <laughs> and then even a cheap uh, shinai, the bamboo sword is like $80. So uh, I had money monthly, but I didn't really feel like saving up to buy a set of armor and everything else. Um, but I did find that a local karate school taught Japanese swordsmanship on Fridays. But you had to reach a certain rank in karate before they'd let you attend that class. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll go and I'll, you know, try it out. And, you know, if I can stick it out until I can start doing swordsmanship, then I'll start doing swordsmanship there. Um, and that didn't turn out the way I expected it to turn out. Uh, yes, uh, well, I, I fell in love with karate, for one thing. Okay. Uh, I didn't expect to, you know, my my interest that whole time had been in weapons. Right, and then I uh, imagine, because you've connected these dots a bit, you know, your, your interest in martial arts remained, you know, you talked about Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers, but how can I get as far away from wrestling as possible? Well, wrestling is empty hand, sword, not empty hand, so let me go sword, Karate right. closer to wrestling, eh, I'm nervous. Right, exactly. It, you know, when you consider wrestling, it's a grappling martial art. It's all close range. It's very, uh, very close and very uncomfortable with regard to people's personal space. Swordsmanship is the opposite of that. It is how far away can I stay and still do the thing I need to do. Um, karate was kind of a mid range mm -hmm. for me uh, mentally. And so I figured I could do it. I just didn't think I'd you know, have that much interest in it when sword was right there, <laughs> you know, yeah, who, who wants to punch people when they can chop off their heads, right? That's so much cooler. Yeah, um, but it turned out I fell in love with karate. Um, and I fell in love with karate. And then I started doing judo, uh, because the school offered that two nights a week, I started doing uh, Okinawa and Kobudo, they, they offered that two times a week. Uh, when I was finally eligible to train in swordsmanship, the Shinkageru class that they had on Fridays. I started attending that. Um, and then once I ranked out of classes, I didn't stop going to them. Mm. So, you know, they had a beginner class first, and then they had an intermediate class, and they had an advanced class. Well, I started in the beginner class, obviously. But once I ranked up enough to no longer be, like, core demographic for a beginner class, I was supposed to go to intermediate class. Well, I just kept showing up for a beginner class. And, and also intermediate class? And also intermediate class. And then I did the same when I ranked into the advanced class. I would still show up for beginner class and intermediate class and advanced class. So you tr you were treating this this dojo as an all-you-can-eat martial buffet. Exactly. You know, what what, what do you got? What, what you know, does, does, is, is, can I hurt people with it? Cool. Teach me. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Much. Pretty yeah. much. Um, they had a rotating curriculum for the beginner classes and intermediate classes, but it was a little more open for the uh, advanced class. So, you know, you, you get a sense for what the curriculum is and when um, for those first two classes after you've done them for a while. And my first instructor there had actually started me uh, occasionally helping people out. Um, and I was a yellow belt when he was first like, hey, this new white belt needs to learn their basic punches. Can you take them through that for me? And the the funny thing about that is that he stealthily helped me overcome my social anxiety about public speaking. Um, so in Illinois, in order to graduate high school, you have to pass a public speaking class. And... I graduated only with a D minus in that class. 
And the only reason that I had a D minus and could technically pass the speech class was because that was also an English teacher of mine and she gave me extra credit on my written speeches because I failed every single verbal presentation. Was this, was this, you just freeze up? Um, I would either freeze up or I would giggle or I would mumble. Okay. It, it kind of depended on the day. Sometimes I would lock up and I couldn't talk at all. How, Sometimes how were you one-on-one -on -one with people? One-on-one -on -one I was okay, but the, the issue with school that I think made things worse was that I had a very bad school experience overall. Mm -hmm. um, I did not fit in. I was one of the misfits, uh, you know, grand total of three friends through the entire course of school. Um, and everybody else would either ignore me or bully me. Those were my only two options. So uh, I didn't really enjoy engaging with anyone but my handful of friends anyway. So I didn't have much experience with anything beyond that very close knit group of people who have common interests. Got it. But with karate, having it introduced as a, hey, go help this white belt okay, we've got these two white belts. Now they need to learn their first, you know, three moves of this kata. Help, help them learn that. And he just sort of built me up from one-on-one -on -one to one-on-two to one-on-four. And, you know, as people started to rank up along with my ranking up, I would be able to keep, you know, teach mm -hmm. them this next move, teach them this kick. Mm. Uh, and eventually it got to a point where I was helping, I would warm up the class. So now I was, you know, telling everybody what to do at the beginning of the class. And then it was, okay, take all these blue belts over here and run them through Anaku. <laughs> take, uh, you know, and uh, eventually I actually started attending a uh, class that the dojo had on how to teach, um, which was a really interesting class. And I think it's something that more people should look into doing yeah. um, because you know just because you earn a black belt doesn't mean you know how to teach just because you're a very skilled martial artist doesn't mean you know how to teach. But martial arts is is probably the worst at saying you know how to do this cool now teach it and we assume that one <laughs> equates to the other and it's you know we, we've done we've done episodes on our solution to that matic but yeah back to uh, yeah it it was just it was a very simple premise, it was, okay, it's a whole bunch of us who are assistant instructors or instructors or, you know, want to be instructors. And we would have a class. It would literally be a class, but it would be people taking turns teaching or leading parts of that class. And then the chief instructor would occasionally stop it and say, okay, what went well with this? Why did it go well? What went wrong with this? Why did it go wrong? How can we improve on that? Mm. Um, and it was sort of very organic. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a typical school experience where somebody mm. just gets up and talks at you for an hour <laughs> and tells you how to do something. Um, and I think that was a really valuable experience. But that whole process was gradual enough uh, that by the time I was a green belt, I was able to give a full speech and presentation in front of a grade school, an inner city grade school of about 800 kids plus the entire faculty on, uh, and it was just on the importance of, you know, staying in school and that kind of thing. Nothing crazy, but, you know, karate guy and I'm going to break some boards. It's going to be fun. Uh, but I went from, you know, not being able to give a presentation to 15 people in school to being able to do that. Mm. Um, so, it, that's one of the things that surprised me about it. I know this is kind of a tangent that we've gone the show off. Is all tangents. <laughs> keep, keep going, man. Um, but yeah, that that also instilled in me the, the passion for teaching. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed teaching once I got to a point where I was comfortable with that dynamic. Did that um, surprise you? Did you have any moments where you stepped back and went, wait a second, it wasn't that long ago that my, my teachers kind of fudging my grade so I can pass this class because being in front of people sucks to, I like being in front of people and sharing what I am passionate about with them. That surprise you? It, it absolutely surprised me, but it, I don't know that there was a singular moment where it hit me. I think it was just one of those things where every now and then I'd realize some little thing 
of you know, I couldn't I couldn't do this in school. I couldn't mm. lead a I couldn't even lead a group project in school. Mm. Now I'm I'm telling this group of, you know, five orange belts how to do this kata and I feel good about it. Mm. And you know, later on they'd ask me a question that I didn't know the answer to, which would normally have also made me freeze up and instead it just made me go, I want to know that also. <laughs> That is a good question. Let me find out. Um, so just a lot of little light bulb moments uh, that kind of culminated with that presentation for that inner city school. Mm. It, when I got asked to do that, um, my my girlfriend at the time's mother worked at that school. That's how I ended up getting asked. Uh, when she asked me, there was the initial flood of anxiety and fear and then it just sort of went away. <laughs> I'm like, you're just gonna, you're just gonna talk to him like a class. Like, right. what's the big deal? You've done that already. I mean, it's a bigger class <laughs> by several hundred. For sure. Um, but it, but you've basically done it already. None yeah. of the stuff that you're going to talk about is new. Um, and that was the, the final crowning moment, I think, of of overcoming that. Uh, and I still have social anxiety about talking to people and talking in public, but it's one of those things that once I get up there and start, I can get past mm. it in a way that I couldn't before. Mm. So this, excuse me, this idea that you, you step into this martial arts school and just keep adding, keep consuming, keep making this your obsession is the word that's coming to me. And I don't mean that in a negative way, because I can certainly identify with it. What did the people around you, you know, maybe those friends from school or your parents say about Noah, the obsessed karateka? <laughs> um, my parents were mostly just surprised that I was so interested in it and that I was sticking with it uh, because of that experience, uh, you know, with wrestling. Mm. Uh, so it was one of those things where even once I had had that interest to learn swordsmanship, which came about in probably junior year, so I was 16, 17, where I could have probably asked them to pay for some sword lessons or karate lessons. Uh, but at the time, I just figured they wouldn't because of wrestling. They wouldn't want to get me started and have me quit after a couple months because it's terrible. And so that's kind of why I waited till I was an adult. and I, I wouldn't feel like they would be put out if I quit. I understand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were mostly, because of that, just surprised that I was enjoying it so much and that I was sticking with it. Um, my friends uh, didn't really have much to say about it because, uh, you know, we were all at that point having graduated high school, starting careers and all this other stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was just one of the things that I was doing. And they'd occasionally say, hey, are you still doing that? Yep, still doing that. I'm a yellow belt now cool and we <laughs> go on about our day um it, it was weird weird in a way because uh my you know my small group of friends we stayed friends within the sphere of interests that we had and didn't really have any uh, uh, crossover they didn't have they didn't gain an interest in martial arts because i was doing it or anything like that um what, what were what were your common interests with them oh uh, anime was one for sure. Um, computers was a big one. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, was lucky enough to be raised in a household that had a computer already, uh, which for my generation is, is impressive. My dad bought a computer in 1986 mm -hmm. um, because he was a master tool maker for uh, Candy, Amiga, or TI? So I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay. Um, okay. But I, I want to say it was an Amiga, but I, I can't. I, I would love for you to find out. I would put money. It was one of those three. <laughs> it might have been. It might also have been an IBM, um, but I, I don't remember for sure. Okay. But uh, my dad was a master tool maker for Caterpillar. Mm. And so he was, you know, intimately involved with the manufacturing process. And he decided in 1986, computers were going to be the future. 
And so he bought one and he figured, uh, you know, when I was born and then later my younger brothers were born, that his his kids were going to know how to use a computer uh, because that was that was the way the future was going to go. Yeah. Um, and he was not, right. He was absolutely right. Uh, and now I work in IT professionally. So it worked out. Thanks, Dan. Um, right. Exactly. Um, when when people talk about, uh, you know, privilege, that's one of those things I I, I recognize 100 percent that I was born into a privileged situation on that front. Uh, you know, my my parents could afford a computer for mm -hmm. one thing, uh, found value in the computer. Eventually that we could afford the Internet, all that kind of stuff. So I, I recognize that I was a very uh, you know privileged kid and that set me up well for adulthood. Um, and not everybody has that, which is really uh, unfortunate. But martial arts is one of those things, I think, that kind of bridges that gap a little bit between mm -hmm. privileged and, and a lack of privilege, provided the schools are willing to work with people on, on you know being able to afford classes. Obviously, it's a business that you need to keep open. Um, but if you can help people, I think you should. Yeah. Mo and most schools, just in my experience, and this is as much for the audience as anybody else, most schools will work with you if you show you are worth working with. Yes. They may not advertise, hey, if you can't afford this, we'll knock your tuition down. But if, if you are genuine and you offer to, to, to make an exchange and, and, you're, and you show up and you are dedicated, they want you on the floor. They will Absolutely. work with you. Not every school, but most, in my experience, vast majority. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of uh, instructors that I've spoken to over the years that have students in their dojo who pay their dues by mopping the mats and cleaning the bathrooms. <laughs> or, it's an old school way to do it, too. It is. And even um, when I started training with my Shorinru instructor, um, the way that that ended up working out was I have started helping with classes mm. and they would pay me for helping with classes but at a certain point it was the same cost as my attendance fees were so they're just like we'll, we'll call it good you're helping out with classes teaching uh and then you know i started doing their social media uh, accounts as well and they were just like don't worry about your dues, you're, you're paying your dues by yeah. doing all this work for the dojo. And yeah, you're right. It's not something that's going to be advertised because while it does, those kind of things can keep the school running, uh, they don't keep the doors open because of, right. you know, funding needs. But um, yeah, and other schools have uh, like scholarship programs where people yeah. donate over time and that co you know contributes to a fund that they can use. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of great ways of bridging that gap with martial arts. And I think that that's a really great thing that it can do um, that it doesn't necessarily get all that much credit for. Mm. Well said. So you, you mentioned another school. So at some point you left this original school, you went to another school. I think you even acknowledged that the, the man in the photo above your head, uh, I think you spoke about him in the past tense. Yes. I, I don't um, know if those two things are connected. So what uh, what my <laughs> my journey consisted of was uh, I trained in Illinois, in central Illinois, um, in Shuriru Karate, which is an American eclectic style founded by a man named Robert Trias. And kind of uh, heard of that guy. Yeah, he's quite uh, quite well-known in American karate circles, founder of the USKA, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I started in Shuriru there, then I started in Judo there, I started in Okinawan Kobudo there, I started in Shin Shinkageru in Iaijutsu there. And, you know, that was my foundation. And uh, mm -hmm. when, after I reached Brown Belt, I got a job in Phoenix, Arizona, and I moved all the way across the country. Uh, and when I did that, I had intentions of training, my, continuing my Shuriru training. There were two high-ranked Shuriru instructors in the area. But the schedule that my work gave me uh, was a Stupid late job. shift. Yeah. So by the time I got off work, 
the classes were half over or over, depending on the school, when I would get there. So it would be, you know, pay the dues for the classes and then maybe get 20, 30, maybe 20, 30 minutes of training each time I go. Uh, and that just didn't work out. Work. But there was a judo club that had later classes. Uh, and you'd and already been doing judo. And no, I'd already been doing judo. Like enjoyed judo, which we didn't really talk about because it <laughs> that's even closer to wrestling now. It is. So uh, I will say I did not enjoy judo as much as I enjoyed karate. Uh, and there were days where I hated it. Oh. But I found the value in it kind of outweighed those days. Uh, you know, because I, I would have bad days where it just, I, I couldn't make things work. I'd get thrown over and over again, and I couldn't I couldn't throw anybody, I couldn't defend a throw, save my life. Judo, uh, and judo can be rough. Judo, judo can be so, yeah. and, I, and I've, I've only, I've dabbled, you know, I, I dabbled a teeny little bit. Yeah. And it just, you know, those those days where you, you hit the mat and, and maybe you weren't quite ready for that throw and you land yeah. just a little bit off from what you want and everything that follows for the rest of class hurts. Yep. Even if you Absolutely. do them right. Because yeah. <laughs> now you're compromised. Yep, absolutely. I, I messed up this shoulder uh, worse. Uh, I actually messed up this shoulder trying to uh, do sword stuff before I learned swordsmanship. Uh, I uh, I had the bright idea. To have, I had this rope hanging from a beam, and I was using a uh, an oak tree stake that I had sanded down to a sword shape. <laughs> Like a poke, yeah. Uh, and I was using it uh, to do these moves I'd seen in anime, basically, on this rope. But the rope, at some point, wrapped around it and yanked it because of all the swinging around, and it tore my rotator cuff. Um, um, I, 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 I think we have enough time in together that I can tease you for a moment and say you lost to a rope. I lost to a rope. I did. Uh, I had no I, I've training. I've lost to when worse, lost but that's to but that that's rope. new. That's a new one. I like that a lot. That's yeah. Uh, I had no training when I lost to that rope. Of course, but I still lost to a rope. Um, but yeah, and landing bad in judo messed up that shoulder worse. Made sure. uh, uh, injured my knee worse. So I those who don't know, I have a um, connective tissue disorder called Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Yeah, I'm familiar. Uh, which means that my joints are hypermobile and it's easy for them to dislocate, slide out of place, uh, and they hurt basically all the time. <laughs> so uh, it makes that even more difficult to, to handle some days. So uh, why I'm, I'm going to pull back about 80% of my rope comment, given, <laughs> given this new information. I kind well, of feel know, like a schmuck, but you know. I, hey, I didn't know I had this at the time. I, it, at the time, people still thought growing pains were a normal thing. Uh, if you if you aren't aware, growing pains not actually a normal thing. Um, you should not hurt to grow. The, the physical kind, anyway. Yeah, the, the actual right. your joints hurting when you're growing uh, is is not supposed to happen. Turns out, <laughs> but at the time we didn't know that. So uh, I only learned about my condition actually fairly recently, to be honest. Um, you'd think we would have figured that er out earlier from all the dislocating <laughs> that I dealt with, but um, I don't look like I have Ehlers-Danlos, so. Uh. I, I have the folks that I've known that, it's funny, I've only known a few people with it, but they all defy what I would imagine them to be, which would be, you know, couch potato, very sedentary. And, and the few folks that I've known, two or three, went the opposite way. And they're like, I'm not letting this control me. I'm, I'm going to be an athlete. Yeah. Well, it from what I gather, the the look of an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome patient is usually uh, overweight, sedentary, mm. or very, very thin, and usually longer limbed than would be normal, the lanky people, okay. right? Um, and so I literally had a doctor walk into an office uh, to give me a second opinion on this and literally just looks at me and goes, you don't look like you have Ehlers-Danlos. I'm like that's that's not oh, how that's medicine a works. Exam. <laughs> that's that's not how this. I'm not the doctor here, but I know that's not how medicine works. Um, but all that all that to say, uh, you know, it it makes it tough to train regularly. And as I get older, it gets worse. 
so I, I have to, uh, you know, make sure that I'm staying on top of, uh, of that training. But, uh, you know, when I was younger and I was actively doing judo, uh, you know, I, I literally dislocated my knee, snapped it sideways uh, in, uh, in judo. I, I dislocated the shoulder uh, to the point where I had to modify certain throws and uh, do them wrong if you're looking at the official, you know, Kodokan manual. Uh, but it was also uh, a very different experience from my first judo experience because the school that I started in did traditional Kodokan judo. So it was a little more old school. Uh, literally 50% of the training was groundwork, which is abnormal for most modern judo schools yeah. because groundwork doesn't win in tournaments as much as the big flashy throws because they want you to do the big flashy throws so that people watch it in the Olympics. But doing traditional judo, we literally did one day of the week was stand up grappling and one day of the week was groundwork. Uh, and it was, the instructor was very big on making sure you knew how to do the throw correctly. Hmm. Uh, and it was more about doing the throw as effortlessly as possible. And then when I moved, I started training under Olympic alternates. <laughs> and I think a little bit of a culture difference there. A little bit there. The first day that I uh, went and trained with them, uh, they were like, all right, we're going to quiz you. We want to see what you know, because you've, you've done judo, but you did judo outside of our organization. You have a green belt. We don't even do that in our school. They only did white, brown and black. In, mm. in their school. Um, so you've got a green belt. We don't do that really. So let's see what you know. And they started quizzing me. And I knew and could demonstrate properly all of the throws that they required of black belts. Really? But mm. they were like, you, it's, it's all very textbook. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That, that's bad? Right. I was very confused at the time. I'm like, I don't understand the problem, but okay. Sounds, sounds like a compliment delivered like an insult. Exactly. Exactly. This, this sounds like backhand. Should I, should I be insulted? I'm not sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I started to train with them, it, it occurred to me why they said that and why it felt that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, Olympic judo, there, are, there were two maxims that the founder of judo set out with, and that was mutual benefit. Everyone involved should be benefiting from the practice of judo. And maximum efficiency, minimum effort hmm. was the other one. And when I was doing traditional judo, those two things were very much part of the process. Everybody should be getting the chance to practice. Everybody should get the chance to benefit. If somebody isn't able to do something, then we want to try and give them more opportunities to do it. Right. It wasn't competitive. It was, you know, collaborative, we'll mm. say. But when I was training under Olympic alternates in Olympic judo, especially the idea of maximum efficiency, minimum effort was not there. It was maximum effort all the time <laughs> it was if you start a throw finish that throw no matter what no matter how hard it is no matter how out of position you are no matter how not off balance they are make that throw happen it feels like you stepped into an energy drink commercial a little bit <laughs> it was much higher energy that's for sure um yeah. uh, i mean they were also crossfit um coaches and so our warm-ups were literally a crossfit workout before we did judo um, which, you know, got me into even better shape, but, oh man, that wipe you out before you even got to technique. Um, but, as, and as they, an aside to, to schools out there, um, if, if you want to do rugged conditioning, don't put it before technical work, especially technical work that involves <laughs> learning things for the first time. Yeah. Just, yeah. When, no, just a thought. Yeah. When your legs are jello and you're, <laughs> Your visions of trying to do this. Not Vision and standing are, are good prerequisites to, to are, most things in martial arts. They do help. They do help. Um, and, the, you know, they changed a lot of my throws uh, 
to be fully committed throws. So there was really no way to back out once you started. It was either you get completely stopped by the person's resistance or you flip with them, um, you know, because that's how you win. You got to throw them with a full flip so they land on their back and you win with the opponent. Uh, which meant that your throws were not always done very well <laughs> and were sometimes dangerous to yourself. Um, because technically, head diving was illegal. You weren't allowed to like dive and throw your head into the mat um, to throw, oh. except that literally everyone did it. Like it's in the Olympics. People are doing it. So it's against the rules technically, but I've, I've watched an Olympic judo medalist slam his head on the ground in order to throw somebody and win um this sounds that, like rewarding <laughs> behavior that, that a martial art might instead discourage uh, well and, and it, it goes even farther than that most martial artists sh should be familiar with ukemi or break falls mm -hmm. if you're teaching sweeps or throws or takedowns you need to teach how to fall safely I would say most martial arts schools do that, at least to some degree. Yep, I would agree. Judo does it more, obviously, because it's focused on throwing. Except that once you start competing in judo, when you're in a competitive school, they teach you how to fall wrong. So they go, okay, all of your safe ukemi practice is great, but when you're competing, don't fall that way. Because, because falling that fall way... Right you lose points. You lose. Exactly. If you fall properly on your back, you know, distributing your weight like you're supposed to, you lose. So fall wrong. So uh, you start out learning how to break fall properly. And then when you start competing, they're like, okay, now this is how you flip in the air. So you land all twisted and hurt your elbows and shoulders and break your fingers uh, so that you don't lose. This is silly. <laughs> it is. And that is, that is indicative, I think, of one of the issues of making a martial art into a sport, especially an Olympic sport, because Olympics being the biggest stage in the world for amateur sports, obviously there's a prestige to that, and people who are, participate in things that are in the Olympics are going to oftentimes have that goal. It may be a very distant goal. It may not be a realistic goal for everybody, but a lot of them will have that goal. And so you're going to want to train to do what they do. Hmm. And if a rule set is changed enough times, it diverges from the intent of that martial art in particular to be a spectator sport. And when it becomes a spectator sport, the martial effectiveness no, no longer matters. It's different when it's a competitive sport that isn't a spectator sport. What I mean by that is, if you consider something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for a long time, that was not a spectator sport, even though they had competitions. They had lots of competitions. Still do. Uh, but we have seen over the past you know, decade or two, these bigger we're having super fights and and you know big streaming events where they're doing uh you know they're doing brazilian jiu-jitsu competitions but it's a spectator sport but before the spectator sport it was focused on being the better martial artist in that context really exciting if you're one of the two people kind of boring if you're everyone else exactly you're not you know and you you see that in uh people complaining about mixed martial arts fights when it would go to the ground before people had any idea of what groundwork really was, you'd hear tons of booing in, in the crowds watching mixed martial arts fights. To, to the audience, go back to, I forget which number, which UFC number it was, but uh, Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock. And I remember watching that with a friend and they were they were tied up for 45 minutes. Yeah, and the yeah, ref found an excuse to stand them up. And within 15 seconds, they were back down and they're just yeah. clinched. Yeah. And, and they, I'm looking at them going, how long are we going to watch this? Right. This is miserable. Right. When you don't know what's happening, uh, and especially yeah. when you're looking at people who are high level at the same thing, uh, it, it becomes a chess match and you can't just make moves uh, without 
thought. You have to consider second, third order effects of whatever it is you do. So of course it slows the pace. But again, when you're training to compete and determine who is better at executing that martial art, that's one thing. When you make it a spectator sport, you change the rules to get rid of the boring stuff. Mm. Uh, And you don't necessarily ban it. Like, judo didn't ban groundwork. But what they did was they made it so you only had a limited amount of time on the ground. And it was harder to win on the ground. You could you had to pin somebody for 30 seconds. Pinning somebody for 30 seconds who doesn't want to be pinned is not easy. Right? It's it's not like some other, you know, 10 count pins. The 30 full seconds. Uh you could win by a, a stranglehold or a joint lock if they tap out. But because you had such a limited amount of time, most people could resist long enough to not mm. have to tap or they'd just let it go and they'd get their arm dislocated or they'd get choked unconscious and then they'd get back to it because that wouldn't end the match. Mm. If you didn't tap, you didn't lose. So if the time ran out of being on the ground, which I think was originally 30 seconds, but I think they've lowered it again since then. Okay. Uh, and then of course, in addition to penalizing the groundwork in that sense, they incentivized the throws Because you can instantly win if you throw somebody with a big throw that lands them on their back. Uh, And you can win quickly by doing two of them where they kind of land half on their back. So, you know, they're incentivizing big flashy things that aren't necessarily tactically the best idea from a full martial arts perspective, right? When you're thinking about throwing somebody, you know, where you're going to also flip to make them fall, strategically, not a good idea in the wider sense of martial arts, especially self-defense. You know, you don't, you don't want to also fall down Mm. (laughs) when you throw the guy. So um, again, I know we've gone off on a tangent. I'm a karate guy and here I am rambling about judo, but that's, that's been my judo experience. (laughs) So I'm, I'm curious, was this, let's call it departure from you know, kind of the, the academic, the cerebral approach to judo, did that create, I'm trying to, I know that I use this word without judgment, an overcorrection to go further into the the cerebral side, the academic side of martial arts? Did I don't say this isn't it. So I, I really liked this. I'm going headlong here. I don't know that it was necessarily an overcorrection. I think it was more of a, a, a reaction out of relief of getting okay. back to something comfortable in, embrace. in a way. Yeah, in, embracing okay. it. So when when my work schedule changed, and this was two years. I spent two years just practicing my kata and doing bag work mm-hmm. and whatnot, training by myself. And I was still training regularly, but it was by myself. And then while you're or, also doing judo. You're right. Two or three days a week doing judo. Uh, but then... I was researching through that whole time and I found people like Ian Abernethy, uh, you know, doing practical kata application. And that wasn't the kind of kata application that I had learned. So when Mm -hmm. I first saw it, I'm like, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. I'm looking at it and it doesn't look like the kata. But I'm intrigued. I like the idea of having practical applications for these. Something about it resonated. Right. And so I, I started finding more people along those lines and I decided, okay, I, I want to do Shorinru. It's similar ish to Shuriru. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are some instructors around. It just so happened that Richard Pogue was the, the first one of two that I visited. Uh, and uh, I ended up training with him. But uh, he obviously was very welcoming and uh, was cool. excited to have. Uh, somebody come in with experience who was interested and uh, just sit, you know, I sat down with him for probably two hours after that first class, just chatting with him about my karate experience and his karate experience. And it became very evident that 
he wasn't the kind of person who just does it. Mm. You know, he thinks about it. He mm. considers it. He evaluates it. He tests it. And he didn't want his students to be carbon copies of him. He wanted them to learn how to learn karate. And that kind of brought back all those initial things that I enjoyed about all of the stuff that I memorized when I was first, you know, diving headlong into karate and it developed my obsession um, to the point which, by the way, I had a website blog that I called Karate Obsession for several years. Yeah. Um, which, I, I, know, I know a few people who, who <laughs> I could have guessed would have had that, but you would have been on the list for sure. Uh, it, interestingly, I had a blog before that called My Budo Geek Life. Uh, <laughs> I would not have given that one to you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I decided to be uh, just weird about it. But uh, was, it on, was it on GeoCities? It was not on GeoCities. It was a, it was a blog spot. It was a blog okay. spot. All right. Um, I, when I when I did GeoCities was before I did martial arts um, and Angel Fire. Angel you remember? Fire. I forgot about Angel Fire. Yeah. But All right, keep going. Uh, but yeah. So all that said, um, I started training with this instructor who was only three years older than me. He's not, but he started when he was four, <laughs> which makes a difference. I had a little bit of time in, yeah. Right. Um, but he. He had actually trained in Shuriru as well, so he knew where I was coming from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on that front. So he could help me make the adjustments. Um, but he would also give me just so much to think about beyond to memorize this thing. Mm -hmm. So he 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 found pretty quickly that I could memorize a kata quickly. Um, that wasn't an issue, right? Getting getting the kata curriculum memorized for me by that point was easy because not only had I memorized you know everything that I needed in my previous school, um, but I had attended several little seminars they did where I got to learn kata from other styles as well. Mm. So I knew more kata that I needed to begin with, and then I started <laughs> learning all these other ones, and it got to a point memorizing them wasn't an issue. But then he give me stuff to think about because it wouldn't be, okay, the bunkai you need to learn for this move is that you're doing this against this thing. Now practice that for 17 hours before you learn the next thing. Um, you know, which was a little bit more what I was used to from the perspective of kata application. It, it was all prescribed. Every technique in the kata had one application that you had to memorize, but you had to memorize it different ways in in that school you had to be able to tell somebody non-verbally how to attack you for it so that you could do it then you had to do a verbal interpretation where you explain everything that you're doing and then you had to do a uh, full run of the kata with people attacking you mm -hmm. um, but these weren't practical applications these were very much the the kind of applications you'd see in the old jka films it's really kind of children's applications basic applications um, that at the time I didn't question. I was just memorizing and I was enjoying the process. Um, but as I got more interested in how to use it, my mindset started to shift and he didn't ever give me one application ever. <laughs> Every single time I would ask about some part of a kata or he would teach about part of a kata, he would always give you at least two examples because it was important to him that you understood that it is a movement and a posture. It doesn't inherently have a singular application or purpose. Yeah. I, I, I want to pause here for a moment because not every school has this open interpretation. In fact, there are schools that really preach this move in this form is doing this. And that memorization you're talking about never changes that never goes away and i've trained at schools like that and i i can understand that i understand why that is now i i i was very fortunate i grew up that that was never it it was very much like this gentleman you're talking about 
it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And that open-mindedness, I think, has a lot of value in it. But given that there's a transition in here for you from one way of thinking to another, and you talked about Ian Abernethy, who's been on the show, and shout out to Ian, he's awesome. And this, this what feels like a, a, a big and also, maybe not long time-wise, but not an overnight transition for you, because I know enough about you now to know that on the other side of this, this is this is huge for you. This is a very fundamental shift in how you approach martial arts. Mm-hmm. Was there any intellectual resistance as you go through that shift? There wasn't any resistance necessarily, but there was certainly a disconnect at, at some okay. at some points because he would show an application, and I wouldn't always understand why that would be an application for that movement because it didn't it didn't look the same and i would have to mull it over i would have to think about it more i would have to go through it in the air visualizing it i say visualizing although i don't technically have that capability i have a fantasia i just learned that that's a thing <laughs> that not everyone can visualize yes so when I when I talk about visualization, what I'm actually doing is I am imagining the feeling of moving, not not seeing what I'm doing, but yeah. how it would feel to do something is what I'm imagining. But yeah, I would I would do that. I would think about it over and over. It would come to me when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, uh, you know, and I'd have to try it out with people, and it would take me time. And occasionally ask more questions. Can I see this again? To understand that the reason it was an application for that movement, even though it doesn't necessarily look like that movement, is because it has the same underlying principles and it's doing the same kind of thing, right? But you're using it differently. Mm. Um, a, a good example is the, the crossing action that you get before a lot of your um, ukewaza or blocking techniques, right? I had always looked at those techniques as the end part, mm-hmm. the end posture. And even in Shuriru, they did teach us that, you know, you, you parry first and then you do the block. You parry first and then you do the block. They, they did teach both pieces of that. But Richard Pogue would weaponize this. <laughs> So, yeah, you might be parrying with this hand, and this hand that's setting up to do something, setting up, he's hitting you with it. And I'm like, it didn't even occur to me that you could hit somebody with that. Mm. Right? Blocks or strikes. Blocks or strikes, exactly. But at first, that didn't make sense. (laughs) And so because I had never considered that possibility, it didn't look right. Like, well, you're you're pun you're not you're not setting up and and blocking. You're punching him. And I had to kind of reconsider that the kata are templates. They can't show you every possible variation of a technique because they they would be infinitely long, infinitely complex. They're templates. They give you set examples that are kind of ideal. They're giving you idealized examples of techniques and of drills, uh, of developing postures, all kinds of different things that they teach you, but they're templates. You then have to expand on those templates. You can't just copy the template forever. This is the same thing as uh, if, I don't know if you've ever taken an art class, um, but in art class, they do have shape templates for helping you to cleanly draw Mm. curves and angles and things like that. But the thing is, the way that you use those templates in the beginning of an art class is not the same way you use them at the end. Because, yeah, in the beginning, you lay the template on the piece of paper and you trace the circle, trace the triangle, right? But at the end of the class, you put the template on the page and you do part of the circle and then you move it. You put part of the triangle and you move it, right? You you no longer have to do it exactly the way that it shows once you understand the underlying principles of how it all works. But that is a process. It's not something that comes to you overnight, especially if you have a background in a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, it was one of those things where in my head, you know, if I'm doing a technique in the kata that way, the bad guy's over there and he's going to attack me from that side and I have to turn and do something. And so the idea that they're in front of me, but I turn didn't make sense at first. <laughs> I was like, well, why would, why would the kata be that way? You know, uh, and just the more historical research you do, the more you see, oh, okay, that's, that's how it developed over time. Example, Mabuni Kenwa's um, statement about the angles of kata telling you how you take an angle in relation to the opponent, not that you're being attacked from all these angles. Um, you know, but before I read that, it never occurred to me. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's yeah, definitely and, not an overnight think, process. Just the point that I want to hit here is, is what you're talking about is the antithesis of the arguments that people make about forms, right? People make fun of, they, they mock forms, they criticize forms. This is useless. Why would you ever do this? And when I see someone saying that, it's very clear to me that, they unfortunately did not receive instruction in martial arts in a way that suggests the instructor understands how powerful forms are. Because to me, it's, it's what are all the things you might ever want to train distilled down into, I like the word template you're using because, okay, do you want to work on speed? Cut the. You want to work on power? Cut the. You want to work on footwork? Kata, you can take and, and you know, I'm, I'm using the word kata because you're using the word kata, but, you know, any, any of your forms, how you approach them dictates what you get out of them. Absolutely. It Absolutely. doesn't just have to be choreography. Yeah. And I think, I, I think it does a disservice to the art to sort of simplify kata to the, to just being a pattern you memorize. You know, uh, if you just enjoy memorizing them, I'm not I'm not hating on the people doing that. But from the teaching perspective, from the instructor's perspective, I think that you're doing a disservice for your students if you don't yourself learn more than just how to perform it and yeah. pass that on because they have so much value in them. But if you don't teach the value, then they'd no longer have that value. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the big issue there. Yeah. So you're, you go through this transition, you know, here, once again, we're, we're, we're identifying all these points of, of intellectual curiosity for you. You know, you use the word nerd early on. Yeah. I think it's a great word for you. I identify as a nerd myself. Um, people who know me are nodding. Yes. Yes. Jeremy's a nerd. <laughs> so it's certainly not an insult coming out of my mouth, but you continue this, this intellectual curiosity, this nerdist perspective on martial arts. And, you know, I want to make sure that we, we get to the, some of the things that you're working on now, but help me bridge that. How do you, how do you get from where you are, you know, training in, you said it was Phoenix area mm -hmm. to, to the more of the contemporary things that you're working on? Well, as I got more comfortable with the practical kata application perspective that my sensei was teaching. And I got a deeper understanding of the material to the point where I was able to derive my own applications. And I would come to class and I'd be like, sensei, I thought of this thing. Can we try it out? And he'd be excited. Absolutely. Yes. Let's try it out. We'd play with it and we'd spar with it and we'd do all these different um, variations and modifications. And uh, sometimes he would then have me teach that to a class hmm. or he'd teach it to a class and say, I got this. Noah had this idea. You know, he would encourage that. And he didn't just do it with me. He did that with, with all of his students as, as we got to that point. That's right? a good instructor. Uh, he highlighted the value that we were bringing in that sense. But then, you know, he was not a technologically in, uh, inclined guy. <laughs> okay. uh, but, he knew that it was important to have some online presence and whatnot. And so early on, I had offered to do the social media for them. But as we had more discussions over time, he had expressed the interest in uh, trying to put more material out there so people got to see 
more of what corrupt they could be. Mm. And we came up with the idea of Waza Wednesday, which uh, became a fairly long running YouTube series that we did together, where every Wednesday we would have a video come out that would go over Kata application or uh, how to apply some basic techniques or some supplementary training exercises or sparring drills, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it started out with just him presenting and me being the UK, the demonstration dummy. Um, and then it grew to where he would have me do a bunch of them. Mm. And we'd have these whole brainstorming sessions where we'd spend an hour or two talking about the kinds of things we were going to show and how to do it. We'd record, uh, you know, and I, I had all this extra footage of us uh, goofing off for one. We, we were, we came across as very serious in those videos, but we, we were being total dorks most of the time. Uh, and uh, But just a lot of play and uh, experimentation and encouragement from him uh, with regard to me coming up with my own ideas and being able to share them. And then in 2017, uh, we attended a seminar with Ian Abernethy. Uh, I believe it was actually his last U.S. Uh, seminar. I don't. I don't think he's done another U.S. seminar since that one. Um, and it was the first one that we had gotten to go to with Ian. Where Where, where was that? San Diego. Okay. Or no, I'm right San around Francisco. that time. Andrew, you know, our Andrew. I believe it was that tour, and Andrew's going to check me on this if I'm wrong. I, I believe also participated in an Ian Abernethy seminar, like as part of that U.S. Where I think it was that year. Yeah. But yeah, 2017. So yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Um, well, it was it was a blast. Uh, we recorded a Waza Wednesday with Ian when we when we oh, did nice. that. Um, but my my sensei had had issues with headaches that would get real mm -hmm. bad sometimes, real bad migraines, and uh, I had always given him crap about his uh, his caffeine habit. Mm -hmm. and, as every time he had a headache, it'd be like, well, if you drink more water and less Monster Energy and coffee you might not have so many headaches. Um, of course, now I feel bad about that because uh, he ended up not being able to finish out the second day of that seminar because the headaches got too bad. And then he uh, had a seizure in the car on the way home. Oh, man. So we booked it to the nearest hospital um, and come to find out he had a brain tumor, a very large brain tumor. Uh, they they helicoptered him back to San Diego, uh, and I had a friend, Dr. Uh, Rafael Gutierrez, actually, a uh, great martial artist uh, as well, uh, who lived in the area. He drove out, picked me up, and drove me to the hospital so I could keep being with him. Hmm. Um, but uh, the doctors didn't know how he had been able to walk, much less attend a karate seminar, regularly teach classes. He competed like three weeks before this. Hello. Uh, That's awesome. Um, it, it, it was, you know, knowing what we know now, it was astounding. Mm. Uh, but of course, also knowing what we know now, we can look back and see signs of of issues in the video that we have of him from that last year you know um and uh he did end up passing away they did they did surgery but it, mm -hmm. it was uh too much trauma to the to the brain yeah, and he ended so up passing sorry. away at the end of 2017. uh and we continued doing waza wednesday for a year after that as sort of a tribute to him, and then we discontinued the series to kind of lay it to rest with him. Um, but you know that had had me mostly taking the lead on that project um, and trying to get other black belts in the dojo to be interested and brown belts in the dojo to be interested. Um, but not everybody wants to get on camera uh, <laughs> and demonstrate stuff for the internet, um, so it was hard to do, uh, and it was. It was taxing emotionally as well because I was so used to doing this with him. Every single week we'd get together, we'd record 
anywhere from one to ten Waza Wednesdays in a week, depending on how much time we had, what ideas we had. Um, you know, and it, it was it was a very different experience, but it it kind of set in my mind the idea that I I can do this. Mm. That, that he set me up to be able to do this. And, uh, you know, I kept, I kept teaching and helping out at the dojo until 2019. Um, and I was supposed to move and open my own school at the beginning of 2020. Mm. And then COVID happened. Rough timing. And neither of those two things occurred. <laughs> so I didn't end up moving, but... I was like, well, I was going to open a dojo anyway. So I'm going to start out of my home. Didn't move, but I, I'm like, from my home, uh, I'm going to start teaching out of here, doing virtual lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when the vaccines came out, I was able to start having one-on-one -on -one private lessons with people who were vaccinated and uh, teaching real small groups and that kind of thing. Uh, and still trying to put out content, but partners were sparse, you know, again, not everybody wants to be on the internet. Uh, so even when I have students, I don't necessarily have students who want to be on camera. Uh, and so I do a lot of more, uh, a lot more solo content since that time. But this got me into networking even more. I I'd already had a pretty strong online presence from Waza Wednesday primarily from all of the advertising and sharing Waza Wednesdays that I've done. I'd also organized a couple training events in Phoenix um, prior to that uh, that got together different people of different martial arts backgrounds to teach uh, and, and have a big uh, cross-training event. I also organized some sparring events where we invited everybody in the area who wanted to do sparring to come over and spar. Um, so I had networked already, but when COVID hit, because you couldn't really do anything physically, a lot more people got into online training and online collaborating. And so I met even more people. Uh, this is also when I got onto TikTok, as, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, and that is how I got more involved with some people that I'd already known. For example, Kyle Doan, um, who you've had on, been on the show before yeah. as well. Uh, Paul Musolf as well. Um, these were these guys were people that I had already been uh, you know connected with online for a while, but we only passed you know had conversation in passing here and there. Um, but we really started to have more conversations uh, mm -hmm. during that time. Uh, I got on to uh, you know Zoom sessions with Kyle. Uh, I taught him Goju Shiho. That was a uh, that nice. was a, he was like it's a, a rough kata to teach over Zoom. It, it a little bit, a little there's bit. There's some nuance in there. There's some. He he, but he wanted to learn Gojo Shiho because he didn't have a version of it, uh, oh. and uh, and he'd been having kind of a rough time, and he needed something good, uh, mm. you know. And so we got together, and we did that. And uh, Paul Musolf eventually flew me up to Michigan to teach at his dojo, uh, and yeah, we just started networking more. I started. Uh, talking with Nathan Ogden Sensei uh, as well, uh, Ron Gillespie Sensei, and uh, last year we had discussions throughout the course of the year about the idea of founding an organization that was style agnostic, that wasn't about engaging in politics uh, or martial arts politics, uh, or uh, about you know, getting a lot of money for us, right? Uh, and we eventually settled on, we were going to start a nonprofit organization called the International Neoclassical Karate Kobodo Society. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, we chose the term neoclassical. Uh, actually, Nathan came up with that term. He didn't come up with that term. Neoclassical is a musical term. Uh, I, I seem to remember some conversation because I remember as, as you all were were uh, um, commenting and, and we'll say cross pollinating with each other's content on TikTok. I remember, I think I remember conversation about how to term this this way of thinking. Yes, and I remember there were different terms that were thrown around, and I you know I don't remember jumping in, but I remember hearing that and just being really fascinated 
that there were not not just one or two other people, but a group of people that were so uh, uh, like minded in in how to approach things that they were debating uh, <laughs> uh, semantics on what to call a thing. And I was like, these are my people. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that conversation absolutely happened because um, a lot of us for a long time have been using the terms uh, practical karate, pragmatic karate, applied karate, uh, all of these different terms. But when Nathan suggested the term neoclassical, which is what he used for what you know he teaches, and he's a musician as well. He, mm -hmm. he plays guitar and, and everything. And, and Isn't he also a pastor? He is also a pastor, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he plays his guitar when he's uh, doing church stuff. Oh, that's but cool. he, uh, as a musician, neoclassical means that you are essentially performing music that is in the spirit of classical masters, but uses modern methods as well. So... Uh, to, to make a very basic and clear example, think uh, somebody playing Beethoven on an electric rock guitar, right? You could consider that neoclassical, right? Got it. Um, it can be way more nuanced than that, right? Because uh, classical refers to a specific time period and a specific way of making music that you could still do today and you know make your own stuff. But that was kind of the way we saw our karate as well because yes we're trying to be practical we're trying to be pra pragmatic we're trying to make it able to be applied but largely the reason we're doing that is because that was the intent right the, the original intent of karate being this effective martial art for self-defense for law enforcement for security personnel those are the people who developed it um and you know the kata are meant to be applied. They they were to record material for you to practice with partners that was supposed mm -hmm. to fulfill that goal. So that is the intent of karate originally. And so if we're looking at that classical era of before karate was modernized for the school system and for large groups and for military preparation, we're looking at that you know pre 1900s idea of what karate was and we're totally fine incorporating modern training methods modern scientific understanding mm. uh, you know we're, we're not necessarily saying we're only going to do it that way but we're in the spirit of that going to continue the process of helping the art evolve mm. right do you do you think that Bushi Matsumura would have said, I won't use a Muay Thai pad. What are you talking about? Uh, no, he, he didn't have Muay Thai pads available. I bet you if he did, he would have used them. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've got several martial arts masters of the past. Uh, consider Miyagi Chojin, the founder of Goju-ryu, said that karate should open itself up to cri criticism from other martial arts and should uh, cross-train with other martial arts and take inspiration from them. Uh, numerous karate masters that in general said that karate needs to have new infusions of information and knowledge and methodologies. It can't um, get better otherwise. Exactly. Um, you know, the, I know Funakoshi made a, uh, made a, a metaphor, I believe, about karate being like a, a boiling pot of water, right? And if you take it away from the heat, then, <laughs> then it, go, it goes still. Um, Chibana Chosen likened it to a pond, where if there's not a, a river feeding that pond, it's mm. going to get stagnant. Um, you know, that's the kind of mentality that we have with it. Is we know what the original intent was, even if we don't necessarily know all the original techniques, all the original applications, all the original methodologies. We know what the intent was, and we have a lot of examples of the material. So with that, we should be able to carry that into the future, keep it evolving. It isn't supposed to be like Ian Abernethy likes to say, preserved in amber. Right? It, it doesn't need to be locked and frozen in time, which a lot of people have done. And if that's what you like to do personally, I understand your your interest is in preserving a thing. Um, but I think it's also important that there are people out there working to progress the art because in the end, if something is only being preserved, it inevitably is going to die out because it's going to 
lose interest. It's going to lose validity and not going to be as relevant as time goes on. We've and, worked through the logic on this show that if all you ever do is pass on what you were taught, it will get worse. Yes. The telephone game. Yeah. The telephone game. Um, I have done uh, a, a telephone game uh, exercise before when I've been teaching uh, to make up uh, movements hmm. of, of kata. Tell me about that. That, so, that sounds interesting. Uh, it's kind of to illustrate this point. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what I would do is I would have everybody get in the line. And I, I will admit that I 100% stole this from a corporate retreat video from work. 100%. But I got everybody in a line, all facing the same direction. The person at the back had to come up with three karate moves in a row. Mm -hmm. Three moves that they know, okay, show that to the next person. And they had to pass it along the line. And then we would have the person at the back of the line and the person at the front of the line both show what they were supposed to uh, have passed on. Should be the same. Should be the same. Probably never, wasn't the same. Never was. <laughs> never was. Um, you know, you and sometimes it depended on how many people were involved and how complex the movements were, were but you had everything from, uh, you know, a hand going from open to closed or vice versa to just a completely new movement being introduced somewhere along the line. Uh, you know, you'd have somebody at the beginning do a middle block punch and it ends up with like a mawashiuke, haitoke situation, just something totally different because you're relying on a very brief glimpse at something then being passed on without fully understanding and, and internalizing that material. And it's a very rapid fire way to look at what happens over the course of time. Because obviously that that's a very small scale experiment, but it shows what can happen when you try to pass something along exactly the same way, especially when you don't necessarily have uh, the supporting material. Mm. Because all of these, all, this exercise I always did with just solo movements. So you don't have the partner work to inform it. Mm. And so that makes it worse. When you don't have the partner work to inform the material, it's easier to change the solo movement because there's no other person involved. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting experiment that I recommend if you haven't done something like that. It's a fun thing to do in your yeah, dojo. Yeah, I'm going to play with that with my students. I like uh, that. Because, yeah, it, it, it really highlights this is what happens over time. Even if you are fine with karate changing over time, it's interesting to be aware of how much that can happen. And especially when you hear so many people talk about kata should never be changed, and you're supposed to teach kata exactly the same way as your instructor taught you. Uh, that's a new idea. That that idea is post World War II karate. That that that's how new it was. It's not a hundred years old yet. That idea. Mm. Uh, you know, karate before that was basically tailored to each student which is, of course, easier to do if you have fewer students. Right. The more students you have, the more uh, generalized you have to make things. But even so, the nature of progression means that you're going to have fewer advanced students, and so you mm -hmm. can tailor it to them as they progress. And that's why you have people who all share a lineage but do things differently. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, Some people see that as a, a, a liability. I see it as an asset. Exactly. Like, if you look at my lineage, there are three big names, big organizations that came out of Chibana Chosin's Shorinru. Mm -hmm. He was the first person to name Shorinru as a style. And he taught a bunch of people, but his three most senior students were Nakazato Shugoro, Miyahira Katsuya, and Higa Yuchoko all three of whom went on to found their own organizations, the Shorin Khan, the Shido Khan, and the Kyudo Khan, respectively. And they all do it a little bit differently. 
it's all recognizable as coming from Chibana. They, they, because you know, they all have the same basic format of material, but all of them do, do things a little bit differently. And there's always the fight of, oh, well, this guy was the real successor. This guy was the most senior. And so that you know, makes his organization the real one. And in reality, they're all doing the karate they learned from Chibana. But Chibana probably taught them all a little bit differently to suit them. So it's not that one of those guys is right and the other two are wrong. They're all right in their own way. And when you have an open enough mind to be able to look at that material and go, I see the value in that material. I see why it's being done differently, or I don't understand why it's done differently and I want to find out. Right? You get so much more out of the art than just going, no, our way is the right way. <laughs> I'm with you. This this is such important stuff, and I really hope people take it to heart. Oh, I'll, we we took a little bit of a detour from the INKKS, and I, I want to <laughs> make sure we get back there because I, I like what you all are doing there. So, you know, this this quest for neoclassicalism within martial arts. If if someone were were to I don't know, go to the website or or check out what you guys do, I know you've put on seminars. You know what what are they going to find? What what's the 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 real implementation as it hits three dimensions on what what this organization is? Well, our goal with it is really to, uh, in the words of a famous Japanese poet, uh, Basho Matsuo, uh, seek not uh, to follow the footsteps of the masters what they sought. We want to help inspire people to do that uh, and help them do that. Because, I, you know, thinking back on my transition from one style to another and that transition from, you know, memorizing set applications to being more freeform with it, that's something that you need help with. You need examples, you need guidance. You, it, you're having a, you're going to have a hard time doing it by yourself. And so we want to put out content that helps people do that. So that's, you know, there's a lot of video content that we share that's either discussion based or examples of techniques, uh, some of it solo, some of it partnered, um, sharing articles from various different sources, not just us, uh, setting up training events like uh, the seminar that was held in February out in West Plains, Missouri. Uh, that was I was supposed to be there, but we had a family uh, emergency that happened, so I missed that event. Uh, but the other uh, founding members of the INKKS taught at that seminar. Since then, we've been doing fairly regular webinars uh, that are free mm -hmm. to INKKS members. Uh, they only cost some of the names on those webinars would be familiar to yes. folks who pay attention to the show. Uh, yeah, if if you're involved in uh, the martial arts community online. Uh, chances are you'll have come across some of these guys at some point. Um, and I say guys, but we've got women who are teaching as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so it's not just guys. Um, and that was uh, an important thing for us, too. We don't want it to be all one demographic of people that are involved. Um, we've gotten uh, quite a list of advisors put together. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that list of board of advisors is on our website as well. And you know, you can see it, it's it, it's kind of a who's who of people from all different martial arts styles, um, walks of life, gender identities, all, all you, this. You've got some great, great people involved in this organization. And, Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this work. Uh, I am, too. It's it's been uh, it's been work for sure to get mm -hmm. things put together. But uh, we've been really uh, honored to have a lot of these people be interested and willing in being involved and helping out. Uh, and they've been uh, you know, open to teaching these webinars and uh, you know, providing articles or videos or content or just discussing with uh, people any number of subjects. Uh, most of them are in our Facebook group for the INKKS and they engage in the content there and they'll give feedback or answer questions uh, and it's very grassroots 
uh, you know. But that I think that kind of makes sense when you're trying to be a non-profit organization that right. is apolitical and style agnostic, right? You're not. Uh, we're not trying to throw ranks in anybody's face and say, oh, you, you have to do it this way because this high-ranking person said so. Um, even as people join the organization, we've got different levels of membership in the organization. If you just want to have access to the content, great. You can you can just join and have access to the content. If you want to become a lifetime member, you can join and become a lifetime member. If you want to register your entire school, you can do that. Um, you know, whatever is going to fit you best. And we're still developing more content uh, for this as well. And so right now, what's coming out in smaller pieces and in these webinars, all of that content is being collected into a repository that members have access to. Uh, so even if you don't attend the event when it happens, the recording is there. Um, we're going to be developing training modules that can help people add to their curriculum, uh, expand on their understanding of what they're doing, set it up basically like a school in a way. Uh, more of a university type school than a than a dojo type school, right? Okay, here is 2ED 101. Here is Katabunkai 101. You know that sort of a thing. Have training modules in that sense. Um, we want to help people develop their curriculum. If you're an instructor and you're teaching and you want to make that transition from the more modern tradition of karate that you might be doing that doesn't have practical kata application or doesn't necessarily have sparring that connects with your kata, uh, you know, any number of things that you want. Maybe you just want to learn additional kata that you don't have in your system. Hmm. Uh, we want to help people get that material. So rather than being exclusionary, we're not an organization that's going to say, oh, you don't do karate the way we do, so you can't join. It's, oh, you want to do karate this way. We're going to help you do that. That's the goal of it, not to be the exclusive club of we do the best stuff, but more these are the best practices that we've been finding as we you know, train, as we teach, as we collaborate with all these other people that fit best with the neoclassical methodology and mindset. If that's the way you want to go, we want to help you get there. Mm. So it doesn't matter that right now you're not doing any kata applications. It doesn't matter that right now you don't have any partner drills, you know, based on your kata. It doesn't matter that you don't do kata X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter what style you come from. If what you want to do is get to a point where you are doing karate in a neoclassical way, that is in the spirit of its original intent, but open to modern additions and variations, we want you to get there with us. We don't want a support keep... system, not a uh, um, judgment. Exactly. You don't have to be there if you want to go there. You'll help them to get there. Exactly. It, it doesn't make sense to create an organization for people who are already at the top of the hill. Right. Uh, you know, okay, that, at that point, it's a good old boys club to make you uh, feel better about yourself but what are you doing to help everybody else? We're, we're much more interested in helping people get up the hill. <laughs> Love it. And, and that's, and that's part of why you're here. If people want to check that out, website, social media, that stuff. And, and, you know, also tell us about your, cause I know you have social media independently of the INKKS. Sure. So well, feed uh, us the links. <laughs> the, uh, the INKKS, the International Neoclassical Karate Kobudo Society. Uh, that website is just INKKS.org kept it as simple as we could. Easy. Easy. Um, uh, it is on Facebook uh, as the International Neoclassical Karate Kobudo Society, full name. There is a page and a group, so you can follow the page for updates, and you can join the group for all discussion. You do not have to be a member of the organization to join the group. It is open to everybody. Um, and we kind of figure that openness and transparency is important. Uh, how do you know if you want to be a member of a thing if you can't see into the thing at all, right? Um, we've uh, also got uh, an account on Instagram, uh, which is uh, at Neoclassical Karate. It's at INKKS on TikTok. Uh, 
We've also got International Neoclassical Karate Kogoro Society on YouTube. I believe that one's also at Neoclassical Karate uh, okay. on YouTube, but I'd have to double check that one to be 100% sure. Um, so we tried to put it out there everywhere. We don't have a ton of content everywhere just yet. We're still building up all of that. You're, you're growing uh, and you're a nonprofit. Exactly. Anybody who's ever been part of a nonprofit understands the mission. The mission is what's most important. Exactly. Um, the mission and, is clear. And uh, yeah, if, and if it helps, when we say nonprofit, we mean it. We uh, we make no money off of this. Uh, all of the funding that comes in uh, is used to go back into the organization to pay for the educational materials to pay for equipment to pay for event venues to pay for all kinds of stuff that goes into uh, running the organization um, n none of us on the board get a paycheck this this is a voluntary thing that we're doing uh, it, you know so don't don't worry about where your uh, where your funding is going I, it's I not going people, to me <laughs> yeah, I think if people take a look at what how much things cost on the website they will know very quickly this is not a labor of of, of capitalistic intent this is yeah. a labor of love yeah we we did our best to keep the the uh the different membership tiers affordable and uh you know yes they may still be outside of the reach of some people um but we do have the option for you to also uh, pay it forward and pay for somebody else's membership mm -hmm. if you want to do that. That's an option available to you uh, because, again, the same thing that I mentioned earlier uh, in our discussion with uh, martial arts being able to kind of bridge that gap. If there are people of means who are able to pay for their own membership and somebody else's, we are thrilled to have that happen. You know, If you can afford to pay for somebody else. And we've already had that happen. We've had people have their memberships awesome. paid for by other people. Um, and that's that's been fantastic because it expands the reach and it builds community. And it, it really is what the spirit of martial arts, uh, I say brotherhood, but, uh, you know, more broadly than that, siblinghood, siblinghood uh, oh, should, should be about, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a, Saying in Okinawan, uh, uchi no guchi, which is uh, ichari bachodi, which is once we meet and speak, we are as family. Mm. And a lot of Okinawan martial artists like to use that phrase. Uh, and you know, if you visit uh, an Okinawan, a traditional Okinawan martial arts dojo, they will often treat you as such. Once you've visited and trained together, we're family now. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, that's kind of uh, something we want to foster in the organization as well. So that's been awesome. going well also. Good, um, good. With, and how about your personal links? Yeah, with regard to my own, uh, I am uh, Illinois Practical Karate. Now that I've relocated out of the Phoenix area, uh, I am in Southern Illinois. So I'm not near Chicago. If anybody's curious about that, I'm much closer to St. Louis than I am to Chicago. Uh, but uh, that would be ilpracticalkarate.com uh, and Illinois Practical Karate on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, YouTube, uh, TikTok. I did it, TikTok, I did it a little different. I did it as uh, at Karate Illuminati. Uh, or karate yeah, Illuminati. Every time I see your handle, it makes me crack up. Uh, that, that's been my, uh, my tagline for so many years now. I don't even remember how long it's been. Since I started saying Hi Sai Karate Illuminati. Uh, even before I started saying Hi Sai, which is Okinawan for hello, uh, I, I was just saying greetings Karate Illuminati for however long before that. Um, I actually have gotten some hate for that saying. You know what? <laughs> it, it, of, of all the things that, that you could get hate for, that that's, you know what? Whatever. Yeah. People I'm, hate. I'm actually wearing my, my Karate Illuminati shirt Oh, as well. <laughs> I just saw the top. Just I just figured. Okay, he has a well placed shirt that says karate up by the. Up it does, by but the it, neck. Is, it is full it's great, karate Illuminati. Yeah. Um, oh, I great. I even had the the artwork on here is based on uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian yeah. Man, but with the opening of Kusanku as the shapes that are highlighted, that's, the triangle, cool. the square, and the circle. Um, 
I because you know there was the whole thing where he was supposedly in the Illuminati, uh, a kind of tongue in cheek reference yeah. there. But oh, it's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's 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 more fun than people give it credit for. They try and try and take it too seriously. I agree. I'm going to throw it to you in a moment to close us up. But before I do that, to the audience, you know, this, if you knew Noah coming in, you knew this would be a longer than, than average episode. I, I expected that. Hopefully you knew we were going there too, Noah. <laughs> I, some, I have some, an idea. <laughs> some really great stuff, some wonderful conversation. I've truly enjoyed this. But I hope you will check out what Noah's got going on and what the INKKS has going on. And if you missed Kyle Doan's episode, you know, go back. We, we talked about him a bit. He's been on the show. Go back and, and check out that episode. I forget the number, but Andrew will likely drop it in the show notes. Because the more we can build these connections with people who are doing cool things, the more it benefits everyone, right? It, it supports, if you think about the whistle kick mission of connect, educate, and entertain, of getting everybody in the world to train for six months, supporting these sorts of things lines up with that. So for all of you out there, even if joining organizations isn't your thing, I want you to be aware of what organizations are doing because you might bump into somebody else that says, you know, I'm, I wish I had this resource. Oh, well, you should go check out these folks over here. They're doing exactly what you're looking for, right? So we can all continue to support and grow together. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the full show notes with all the links. Noah, you've been so gracious being here with me today, man. I really, really appreciate it. I feel like I know you even better than I did before, which is awesome. But it's up to you to close us up today, man. What, what words do you want to leave the audience with? Well, I mean, I appreciate you having me, and I think that the the biggest things for me are that that Icharila Chodi statement of once we meet and speak, we are family, I think is something that we really should foster in the martial arts community like you were referring to. Uh, and with regard to the mission of the INKKS and my kind of personal perspective, that quote from Basho, the poet, on seeking what the masters sought rather than following in their footsteps. Those are things that I want people to really think about and really try to see the value in. And hopefully uh, we'll cross paths and we'll get to do some training together one of these days, be that uh, at an in-person event or on an online seminar. Uh, the more people we meet and connect with, the better. 